As you walk through this neighborhood, you will see that slowly but surely the middle class is disappearing. Well, we've lived in this house for 22, 23 years. But before that, my wife and I went to high school in this community in the late 1950s. And then we, lived, then we moved to Vancouver and returned. And we assumed that this neighborhood in our retirement was not going to change significantly. Unfortunately, that did not turn out to be the case. And those changes, I think, are coming about. My personal feeling is they're coming about because of what I would call the inevitability of, of big money uh, understanding or learning that it can exploit uneducated and uninterested politicians and community leaders, which is what I believe uh, we're seeing evidence of in what's happening to our streets here. Look at the size of this one. Well, this one looks to me, as an observer of seeing in the neighborhoods, yeah. is that they've got their garbage out here. Yeah. The gate's closed. Yeah. The curtains are closed. Yeah. Um, it's a good indication that nobody lives in this house. Yeah. Um, there'll be or a car. Or there might be one student there living. There could be. There was a time when if we worked hard enough and were careful enough, uh, owning a home was a realistic goal. Now it isn't for people who are uh, particularly middle class people in this country. And that's happening all over the world. The middle class is under attack. When I'm walking down this road, I don't see any starter homes. No. So you'd be starting at one point eight million dollars to, to buy a starter home. But that's the limit, what I was talking about earlier, you're, that's what's uh, being obliterated from our culture, mm. our community. Right. Is, uh, the starter home is uh, a dimension of the middle class lifestyle right. and ethos. So if you eliminate the middle class, there's no need for starter homes because as Jim mentioned, we're no longer into the the process of people progressively being able to uh, advance themselves up to different levels, like my parents did, like we did. Right. So starter homes is that's uh, that's a concept that's just gone away. I had a cousin in uh, Bellevue, Washington, who is very wealthy. He bought a house like that. There were six members in the family, and even with six members living in the house, there was at least 40% of the house never got used. Really? So they, they are uh, an entire waste of space, a waste of energy, a, a waste of land. This house, now what you have is the cliche car without a license plate. Oh and the basketball net. Yeah, there's if a you, lot of those. Like there's that. a lot of cars without license plates sitting in some of these houses. That's just for the convenience when they come to make their visits. Look at the front lawn. Yeah, uh, blue box at the front yeah. of the door, so that's yeah. where the newspaper goes. So uh, they have apparently companies that come and pick up newspapers yes, and they garbage do. cans. And the only yeah. person that usually uh, shows up to the neighborhood is the uh, person to cut the grass. Yes. Right? Exactly. I mean, sometimes exactly. you'll see mail slots with yep. newspapers all not being picked up. Yes. Um, There's one house near us, the uh, Christmas wreath on the front door was there for five years. It was rotting and falling apart. And it's not just a matter of architecture, it's a matter of the fact that the edifices that are being built, most of them remain empty, or a few of them become hotels, or a few of them have parachute students or grannies living in them. If you walk down Piermont, you'll see there's only five houses, uh, old houses like this one left, all the rest are big mega houses, most of them empty. If you had a child that was coming home from school in the dark, uh, there would be nobody around to help that child if something happened. 
Now, if if you were elderly like me yeah. and my wife, or if you had two kids were living in this house and you had these and these, all or some of them empty, and lived on that house where your earlier question about human activity. Yeah. So you have security issues. How secure do you feel? How safe do you feel? If um, this street you walk down at at night, it's mostly dark. How would you feel if you had a 17-year-old daughter coming home from a part-time job at night? Right. Could you hear her cries for help if there's nobody here? What right. would happen? If you're elderly and you have a fire or an emergency, there's no one around. The, the, my neighbors would be right there to help. They would be out the door in 10 seconds to help. You know, it's not just that a house gets torn down and built. There's a domino effect. The schooling enrollment goes down. The school enrollment goes down. The environment is affected. My lot gets flooded, as is common with most of these houses. They, uh, for whatever reasons, they can only answer. They're not interested in getting to know us or even saying hello to us in the morning. What do these fences say to you? Keep out. Our neighborhood, I grew up in a neighborhood where there were no fences. So people were just, the, the ethos was, hey, we're all sharing this neighborhood and we interact and we go back and forth. What does this say? Well, that's because many of the people that are building these houses and buying them come from a culture that doesn't, that lives mostly inside their houses, their environments. They don't uh, grow up in a culture in which uh, living around or outside the house is part of their experience. We could name it anything we want. What, what it is is a representation of, of a particular culture's values, and it's not our culture. So what's the particular culture? Culture is wealth. Mm, okay. Accumulation of wealth, firstly, and then secondly, the demonstration of that wealth, to show off your wealth. So this kind of house does that. Okay. It, you know, look at, uh, I can take pictures and go back to Hong Kong or China and show my relatives how wealthy I am because look at this mansion that I own in this foreign country. Now Canadians do the same thing, Americans do the same thing, the Brits did the same thing for 150 years. But it just happens to be happening to us, and no matter how many times it happens, doesn't make it right. My son is a contractor. He and his partner could tell you how badly built these houses are. They're only built the last 10 years. Really? Yes. In Toronto, they've had terrible problems with the uh, condo tower issues, because those condo towers weren't built to live in, they were built to flip. And the people that were uninformed enough to buy a condo in there moved in two months later, the doors fall off and the plumbing explodes and things like that. They're not built to live in, they're built to flip. And I think the same argue, argument could be made, designation could be put on some of these houses, not all of them, but some of them. Essentially, the question, even either explicitly or implicitly, is is if you don't like it, why don't you leave? And I think what has happened with the leadership in this community is they have simply decided to uh, provide benefits for one group at the expense of others, and I happen to be part of the other. My language, my opinion, we have become the other in this community not the center or the spoke of the community. The ignorance and the hypocrisy of saying you're not here to change is that we have um, given over the control of designing our community and changing our community to people who don't live here. Well, I'm, I'm talking about offshore people who are not remotely interested in this community other than a place to bank their money. Uh, but we've given them ceded control of the design of the community to them.
Those houses design our community. They're controlling the design. I've, I've spent my life as a designer and a design educator, and it is a hot and button issue for me. Who is in control of designing the environment, designing the community? Uh, if you surrender that control, it's game over. So people have choices, and currently in Richmond, the choice happens to rest with uh, the wealth that's coming from China, mainland China and Hong Kong. 10 years from now, it might be Russia. <laughs> you know, 20 years from now, it might be from Norway, who knows? But the issue is not racial. The gap between the haves and the haves not has widened rather than narrowed. And it was always my naive assumption that in a democracy, one of the tasks that we are supposed to be dedicated to is narrowing that gap. I think that what we've lost sight of is that, of course, change is inevitable, but we need uh, leaders, both community and political leaders, who dedicate themselves to ensuring that the change is for the good uh, rather than uh, the negative. If there is a hope, it lies with the millennials. If they don't get the picture yet that these wealthy billionaires are designing their future for them, self-interested, wealthy, elderly billionaires are designing their future for them, they will not be able to say very much 20 to 30 years down the line and complain about what they inherit.